Good afternoon. How are you? Um, so it's great that I didn't fall. It's great that we have today a very big table full of people. Usually we have uh, one lecturer, uh, maybe two as a debate, but it's great to have uh, five people here today and uh, especially representing different disciplines. Uh, our theme of debate is um, beyond green, we call it, and it is related with the new models of uh, the new urban models of the 24th century in relation with sustainability, in relation with economy, the real estate and, 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 and the market needs. The market needs, the society needs, the environmental needs, so how we can start thinking of um, extending our urban environments or making urban interventions in, uh, in our current moment of uh, uh, crisis in many fields. Uh, we have uh, with us um, today many people. I would maybe start with uh, Ron Bate, that he will be the first one to present very short um, uh, presentation about the project that they are developing in, uh, in New York, in New York. So, uh, Ron Bain uh, earned his bachelor degree in economics from the University of Wisconsin and his PhD at New York Law School. He's the founding partner and CEO of uh, RBH Group and president of RBH Management Asset and Property Management Companies. He's currently developing the groundbreaking Teachers Village project that we would love to hear about it, maybe, and uh, in the historic core of the city. Uh, Ron is as well board member of the New York Real Estate Board, uh, the New York Alliance, New York Downtown District, uh, Take for America and the New York Police Foundation. His uh, real estate uh, work in New York have been featured in the New York, New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. So he will be presenting us a bit the project in New York, which is like a new urban extension, very um, quite revolutionary and, and quite innovative. Uh, next to him, uh, as a second speaker, we have um, Ignacio Jimenez de la Iglesia. There is another person coming from the real estate and the developer, let's say, world. Uh, he founded a real estate consulting and brokerage firm, one of the most considerating and influencing professional among the investing players. As a real estate developer, he led the professional team to launch Valencia Litoral, a project that uh, coincided with the America's Cup uh, 2007 in Valencia. So he did this project together with a French architect, Jean Nouvel, um, and uh, this is the project that he will speak about it today. Ignacio holds a bachelor in laws and two diplomas in advanced management programs in business administration uh, from uh, ESA Business School, as well as diplomas of real estate development from the Harvard School of Design. Next to him, we have Mario Chang. Uh, he studied uh, electrical engineering at the University of California. He started his career at the university's device research laboratory working on solid state device physics. You should explain us what this is. <laughs> Uh, as a serial entrepreneur, started several businesses uh, like the Build Out Strategy from Core Acquisition by boutique private um, equity firm using asset backed securities credit facility on American receivables, securitized by Japanese firm and placed in the European money markets. He also co-founded a high-tech startup in optical networking and for the past eight years has launched cross-border business initiatives with European and ASEAN partners and clients. So, interesting entrepreneur, let's say, vision from Mario Chang. And then we have as well Roussel de Rosa, He's uh, the only architect on the table. <laughs> he graduated from New Jersey Institute of Technology, began working for high-profile architectural firms in Manhattan, including high-race construction in urban environments. Uh, international work, including airport and hospitality resort design, and in 2002 he established the De Rosa Group Architects, and he has been the project architect for Four Corners Millennium, which has been part of Soma Village. 
And last but not least, I would like to uh, introduce you our moderator, uh, ENIAC partner and faculty that he will be uh, as a professor with uh, some of the students this year. So Gonzalo de la Camara is an environmental economist, PhD and currently a senior research fellow and coordinator of the Department of Economic and Institutional Analysis at the Imtea Water Foundation, which is a non-profit research body. He has been a senior lecturer on economic analysis for the last 17 years and a water policy advisor for the European Commission and the 2030 Water Resources Group, as well as international consultant on water and energy economics for the UN system and international banks. Um, Gonzalo is an expert economist but very aligned with environmental projects that we are touching here so he will be the perfect moderator in this multidisciplinary um, table. Thank you all very much for being here with us today and Gonzalo. Hi, good evening to everyone. Uh, thanks, Areti. Thanks, Willie, for inviting me to share this time with, with you. It's very exciting for me to, because I've been reading about the experience in Newark, and so I think it's a great opportunity also for me. Whenever I come to IAC uh, as an economist, you know how I feel. I don't have to explain. Yeah? So, so it's, it's becoming more natural for me, but, but it's like being uh, sort of a penguin in, in the desert or something like that. Uh, Great to, to share this table with you. Uh, I, won't, I won't take much time from you. These are the guys who are going to make this evening enjoyable for you. I just wanted to, to be loyal to the spirit uh, of this institution, of this organization, which is a very creative one and a very, uh, very special one. Um, when, when they phoned me to, to invite me today, they mentioned that they wanted to create the conditions for practitioners, architects, uh, academics to discuss about the future of cities in the 21st century, but well, that's a bit ambitious. I think though that we have a good, good, very good opportunity today because you've been working on the comparison and trying to link the Newark example in New Jersey. Uh, I'll tell you something about this experience in, in Newark in a minute, but uh, you're, you're trying to, to connect that to the world. And I read something in one of your papers saying that uh, you want to connect to the world so that the world goes to Newark. Yeah, that's, that's the basic idea of trying to become global in order to enrich your local experience in, in Newark. Uh, something that they need to, to shed light on uh, this evening is why they call uh, Newark uh, a renaissance city, beacon for America on the Eastern Gateway, hottest real estate market, America's real second city rather than Chicago. So, so there's something going on in Newark. So, uh, I, I go to the States very often, so, so I had an idea of what was going on there, but I never thought it was so, so ambitious, and, and, and I think you definitely have a vision about your, your city. Uh, but whenever I come to IAC, and I think you had the opportunity to share a bit of time with, with the staff in, in IAC, uh, you, you listen to people speaking about issues like self-sufficient buildings, for instance, and I think it's very tempting to seduce ourselves thinking that the solution to the city's problem uh, go through a building. And I think that's not the case. Uh, why? Because, for instance, if you think about a very dense city, and I think Newark is a good example, but uh, I don't know, we could think about uh, dense cities and also very car-dependent cities like, I don't know, Detroit, as compared to a very dense city in Europe, such as Munich, for instance, yeah, which is twice as dense as Detroit, you would see that in Munich, which is mainly dependent on cycling and walking, you would see that uh, energy consumption is 10 percent, uh, sorry, it's, it's 10 times less than, than in, in, in Detroit. So it seems that there's a correlation between the, the increase in density and the energy consumption of the town. And I think it's important, I've always been discussing this as an economist here, that if we build self-sufficient habitats or if we build self-sufficient buildings or even self-sufficient architectural projects in Newark, how are you planning to connect that 
to the city as a whole and even to the world as a whole in the sense that some of the environmental challenges that we're facing are global by nature. So, so that, that would be one of the questions that I would be uh, very keen on discussing today. Another issue has to do with um, something which is very familiar for me as an economist, it might be for you because you're also an economist, but maybe not for the, for the audience, which has to do with the difference between financial profitability, which is something that a developer should always have in the back of his mind, and economic profitability. So I think that uh, as an economist or architects or developers, we have some sort of commitment with, with something which goes beyond our private interest and which has to do with public interest. So how can you make compatible all these exciting development programs and at the same time be able to create uh, economic welfare? Uh, the more I read about your experience in Newark, it makes me think that uh, you, you've, this idea is very clear for you, that as long as you uh, take care of uh, civic spaces, as slogan as you take care of collective ways of doing things, something that goes beyond the, the private profitability of the developer and creates welfare for the whole of the city, will benefit you as well. So we'll, we'll uh, pay, pay off. Yeah? So that would be an, another question that I, I would like to, to discuss with you. Uh, Essentially, I think that when we, when we say that we want to go beyond green is because we want to think of sustainability as, as something which is complex by nature. Yeah? It's not something which is unidimensional. We want to think about sustainability of cities in a wider uh, scene and to wider the scope of, of our discussions. Uh, one of the things I, I've read about um, about Newark made me think that challenges, for instance, in terms of energy consumption are not minor. But, but then also you've got some challenges in terms of uh, the concentration of social exclusion in, in the city. And so I think there are many issues that uh, could be discussed tonight. And I just hope to be able to, to help you uh, come across everything you want to convey tonight. My last uh, reflection would be, today I woke up in Madrid, I had a meeting in Valencia, and I ended up now in, in Barcelona. So uh, my day has been a crazy one, but at the same time made me think about the different towns. I'm sure you know a lot about what's been happening in Spain for the last decade. We, we had a housing boom, yeah? Now the bubble has burst. Uh, not so much as in Ireland, for instance, but it burst. My question would be, uh, you say that Newark is the hottest real estate market, I suppose, in, in the States, which could be also in the world, yeah, or one of the hottest real estate markets in the world. Are you concerned about uh, that impact? Are you aware of the two-way link between macroeconomics and the housing market in the sense that uh, your project definitely contributes to create direct and indirect economic positive impacts. But at the same time, uh, the macroeconomic context, even in the US, is a constraint for, for this development. So this is essentially some of the issues that I think that you could be discussing today. So I, I give the floor to Ron. Table. Yeah, you put a lot out on the table for me. Oh, can someone you, hear me? Yeah, can, okay. can everyone hear me? Yes? Okay, yes. here we go. <clears throat> and it's uh, interesting um, because you speak my language when it comes to macroeconomics um, and uh, environmental and, um, and, and policy, quite frankly. Um, it, has anyone, first let me start off, has everyone, has, has, who in this room has heard of Newark, New Jersey? <laughs> okay, quite a bit. For those of you that have not, Newark, New Jersey is the third oldest city in the United States, and it's nine miles outside of Manhattan. 
but it's actually better located than Manhattan when it comes to logistics um, um, uh, for uh, consumer products, for uh, international products, for uh, and even just if uh, if you just want to go to work. Um, it's it's uh, easier to get to work in Newark than it is to go to Manhattan just because Manhattan is an island and you have to cross over rivers and all the traffic and so forth. So it has a tremendous amount of its, its asset, its, its, its location. But, you know, what, the, the, the thing you're talking about Newark is, is sort of what attracted me to Newark. Uh, first of all, I started my career there about 19 years ago. But the, the beauty I always found in Newark was all its problems. Um, because it, it was a city that had so many problems that epitomized all of the bad policy that was occurring in the United States. From education to crime to urban development you to politics, you name it, Newark had the worst of it. Um, and, 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 um, and so it, would, it presented this tremendous opportunity because it was still the best located land in the United States in terms of the Northeast economy and in terms of its location in Manhattan, except for Manhattan, outside of Manhattan. And, but, and it's also um, big enough to get attention throughout the country, uh, but small enough that it was very manageable to solve a lot of the problems. And what you're starting to see come out of Newark, our mayor was just elected a United States Senator, the governor of New Jersey is a presidential hopeful candidate in the United States, and there are people who started in Newark about 10 years ago that are starting to spread their wings across the country because there are a lot of the solutions underway. And so as a property manager in Newark, I started to see some of these solutions in, in play, and it became very exciting. So from a real estate developer standpoint, I got very excited about Newark because on the macro level, uh, New Jersey, which is this, uh, one of the smallest states in, in, in the United States, but still, uh, again, well located and also very wealthy, um, was one of the first states to hit um, its um, uh, tight public government uh, budgets. So it reached its debt ceilings that we're talking about on the national level now in the United States. We reached debt ceilings in New Jersey about 10 years ago. We also stopped growing jobs. And um, because of this macroeconomics, because the limited budget sort of um, government budgets, I always felt that whatever money the state of New Jersey was going to have for economic development would be leveraged in the largest cities. And Newark is the largest city in New Jersey. So from that standpoint, it was a very exciting uh, play. From another Another standpoint was environmental. Uh, the state of New Jersey had a very strong environmental constituency, and so for, for, so hundreds of thousands of acres were being taken off the la off the table for development, and was becoming protected land. Um, and what was happening because of their strong lobbying and policy uh, positions, every few miles you would go, there would be a different set of policy regulations. So a developer had to go every mile, if you're a developer in New Jersey, every place you went, you had to, there was a whole new set of rules. And so developing in the largest city became very attractive. Because I figured out if I could build a platform, I could build one platform, I'd understand all the rules, I'd understand the market in its entirety, and I could have a lifetime of building if I could just figure out how to unlock the value um, in this city. And the third thing was from a real estate development standpoint, it was uh, cheap land. Um, it was too cheap because of all its problems. Uh, and if you just went like this and you covered your eyes and didn't look at the problems and you just looked at real estate from bottom line, you looked at value of land, you looked at opportunity, it was the best opportunity I was finding in the United States. And so I went with um, um, four uh, individuals, global, uh, global entrepreneurs on uh, businesses throughout the world, all kinds of businesses, and we went and we assembled, uh, which means we went and bought um, 79 block and lots, um, um, and uh, through 30 separate transactions, and we assembled all this land without. Um, I don't know if it's common here in Spain, but it was common when we were buying land that the government would often step in to to take the land, 
to be able to develop it. I don't know if it's common here, but we went onto the private markets, we went door to door and we assembled this land. So even from that standpoint, we're not aware of any project in the United States that assembled so much land in a, in a relative period. And we were lucky, to say the least, but also people didn't want this land. So it was, it was, it was easier to do so. But when we did so, what we had was, um, really a blank canvas to develop the, the, the historic core of an existing city in the United States. Um, and, and, and everything you see here is renderings. It was master planned by uh, Richard Meyer, who's a world-renowned architect. Um, we master planned this with Richard Meyer, but it was really, it was a, we viewed it from the development standpoint as a blank canvas, but Richard Meyer also uh, viewed it as a, sort of a blank canvas to be able to build within the historic core of a city um, virtually um, whatever he wanted. Um, and so um, the SOMA master plan was born through this process. Um, I'll touch on some of the questions, you put a lot out there, but we always viewed Newark because of its location, because of its international airport, because of the, it's the third largest port in the United States, but it's the largest port in the eastern seaboard, so it, it services New York. I mean, everyone thinks they're landing in Newark, New Jersey, the Newark airport, one of the two international airports in New York, they think they're landing in New York. Um, but it, it, it was all in Newark, New Jersey. Um, and, um, and we always viewed uh, Newark, uh, we wanted to, because of its decades of problems, um, we felt that we had the opportunity to not only bring the city to regional acceptance, but to really global acceptance. That if you were going to redevelop from the ground up, you might as well build global character. A, a city of global character and of global worthiness. Uh, this was the area that we're talking about. So you can see it really is the hole in the donut because there was existing development there. Again, it's an existing city. You can see, uh, well, you, see in, you can see how close we are to Manhattan with the views. Um, Penn Station, we point out, is a train station. You can walk seven minutes from our development and you can get on a train and you can go anywhere you want in the country. Or you can take an eight minute taxi ride and be at our international airport and go wherever you want in the world. Um, so to, to you, this, the, the creative class, uh, your generation, you literally, uh, the way I view it is, you're literally on the grid. You are minutes from the grid. You can get on the grid and you're in the epicenter of everything. You can go anywhere. You can go into Manhattan in 16 minutes to Midtown. You can go to Brooklyn. You can go anywhere you want in the country. You're literally steps away from the, the grid. Um, um, and another view of this, you can see on the other side of us, another very interesting point, some of the existing assets that existed in Newark was a very large university system. So we had 50,000 college students, faculty and staff in our university system there. It's a billion dollar economy um, growing at 5% a year and that's sort of what was the, 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 the first comfort that I got from the economic standpoint. That I knew that there was a university system um, 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 that was not talking to the downtown government city hall which sits right here. They just wouldn't talk and so a lot of the answers to your questions, uh, why Detroit less efficient than Munich, why certain things ha don't happen in, and happen, is really comes down to bad policy uh, and bad ideas which Newark was the king of. <laughs> um, every bad policy you can think of was there. And so you can see the footprint of what was going to be our first phase, Teacher's Village. And I'll leave you with this for a second. So, you, from a macro standpoint, we had a very good idea. We thought we had a good idea. We had a bit of a crazy idea. But we went and we bought um, all of this land and we put it on our balance sheet. Um, and um, sitting around the table with Richard Meyer looking at, um, and one of the benefits, not only all the bad policy in Newark, one of the benefits of Newark is because of the bad politics and the bad policy, it was behind everyone in terms of redevelopment. And in the United States in the last 20 years, 20 to 30 years, 20, 20 25 years, we've had some very good plans uh, in our country uh, in terms of 
gentrification, urban redevelopment, re rehabilitation of cities. Uh, we had a lot of good examples that we could study, but we also, keeping to the global nature of what we wanted in the project, we studied plans around the world. And what we became very fixated on was two macro policies in terms of plan. One, we only had to look to Manhattan, right across the river, where it had one million units of rent-stabilized and rent-controlled apartments, protected apartments in terms of rent. And, uh, you know, my colleagues complain from here till tomorrow about the, 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 um, the, the restriction on rents. But what it did was, was preserve a middle-income housing stock. And so in the United States, I'm not sure how in Europe, uh, but in the United States, we were doing very well at producing luxury housing for the wealthy. And we were very good, actually, at producing affordable housing. Uh, there was all kinds of good policy to provide affordable housing and luxury housing. But the middle was left out. And that socioeconomic diversity is the essence of good cities. And so one of the macro policies we came fixated on was a middle income housing stock for our first phase. The other macro policy was we were in the hole in the donut and we had to make this thing an economic success. And so one of the things we, we quickly, we clearly wanted to be green sustainable, um, building a 21st century global development, but we had to be economic sustainable, especially in Newark. I wouldn't be able to get financed in Newark um, if it wasn't uh, economically uh, sustainable. And so what I had to convince people was that I was gonna have a community overnight. And one of the biggest issues with Newark when you walked around was the experience on the street. And so we became very fixated on creating a community overnight, effectuating in one broad stroke the, the community and, um, and, and creating a community overnight. And so we were very horizontal in nature, which is also um, against the real estate developer's DNA. You always want to maximize your development pad, you want to go high as possible, but for, in, in, in the first instance, um, this was, and, and, and we being the beneficiaries of a long-term sustainable community, wanted to make sure that this was an instant success, and so we went horizontally. So none of our buildings were more than six stories. Um, we can implement means of constructability that got us more building, poor, more building per construction dollar, and so we envisioned for our first phase a $150 million project called Teacher's Village. Teacher's Village was going to be workforce housing for middle income um, for teachers. Uh, again, towards economic sustainability, I could convince lenders easier that I am going to rent apartments to the uh, 8,000 teachers that come to Newark every day already and then working in the worst schools in the country that I would be able to rent to them faster than I'd be able to attract someone from Brooklyn to come to me. So from an economic sustainability model, from a, from a developer self-interest, uh, we also created um, an, 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 a, a tool for the city to be able to recruit and retain the best teachers. So we had Richard Meyer design buildings for teachers. I could get my middle income housing stock there, I could celebrate teachers, I could provide a tool to the city to be able to um, recruit and retain the best teachers in the region uh, for all schools. Um, we, so uh, in this first phase, six of the buildings were residential rental apartments over retail, and then two of the buildings were actually new schools over retail. So we produced four new schools, kindergarten through eighth, state-of-the-art facilities with excellent schools, um, for, and created uh, new classrooms for 1,000 children. And, um, and this was an important tool for the city, new state-of-the-art educational facilities. Um, but at the same time, it was a very good real estate development plan because every good plan usually has the three food groups of real estate, residential, retail, shopping, commercial, and then office, commercial. Um, we viewed the schools as our commercial office component. 
but we felt that they were better than commercial office because commercial office at five o'clock, six o'clock, everyone clears out. Our schools are open six days a week. They're open on Saturdays, often have activities at night. And not only do I get the thousand people that are sitting at their desks every day, the thousand kids every day, but now I have a thousand families that have to take the kids to the desks. So the, the demand that that creates for the shopping at the ground floor retail, which is the thread that, can, that combines all of these buildings and which transforms the experience on the street, was good planning. And so I'll leave you with, um, it, uh, I'll leave you with where we're at. Teachers Village, we delivered the first two schools uh, buildings this summer. It's all a lead neighborhood development, one of the first, one, one of two um, projects and one of three projects in the United States, one of a few globally achieving the lead neighborhood development sustainability status. But what we did was in the first phase, uh, and so we have two buildings that we delivered, the school buildings. We have three of the residential buildings under construction. We have a sixth building that's going to be decon that's going to be con breaking ground at the end of this year. Um, this gives you the different uses. Red is residential, blue is schools, parking. We kept everything surface parking at first uh, because it'll go underground later. But for cost measures, we kept it at grade. This is one of our Richard Meyer design residential buildings in the heart of Newark, New Jersey. Um, you can see um, beautiful, nice efficiencies, but I could spend all day telling you sort of the cost effectiveness of everything we did here. Um, and ri even Richard Meyer, Richard Meyer's designs, we did for a fraction of the cost so we can make it economically sustainable for our neighborhood. Um, another view. Everything we did, streetscapes, lighting, planting, um, we defined the characters of the streets. I was commenting to Willie today about your, your city, Barcelona, how each of the streets are defined in terms of its character, in terms of its purpose, in terms of how it drives the energy, the, the population flows through the city. Newark didn't have that, but we had a historic grid uh, to our city that we could focus on and try to create that. This is another residential building under construction. <coughs> this is in a few years. This is what we hope to build. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Nice. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so now, Alejandro, uh, sorry, Ignacio, I'll give you the floor. Good evening, thank you very much for, for inviting me to tell you a few words about the, this project. I don't know if calling it a wannabe project or whatever, because it, it's been around in Valencia for at least, I'd say, uh, maybe nine years now, which is not bad. It's, uh, <clears throat> Valencia is the third largest city in, in Spain. Uh, it's 200 miles southward from Barcelona and 200 miles eastward from Madrid. So it's almost equal distance, which means a lot of things in this, in this country to be uh, equidistant no? from, from Barcelona and Madrid. Well, it has many of the, of, the, of the characters you mentioned in Newark, very bad policies. Um, I don't know, a bubble uh, going on in the last decade, no? uh, uh, that burst finally in the 2008. We had a chance to show the world, you know, what we wanted to be uh, uh, whenever we were going to grow up with the America's Cup. We had uh, the chance to have the venue, the third, second and 33rd uh, America's Cup, which was, you know, like uh, being on the spot. Uh, so, um, well, it's a city that, it's a seaside, seaside city, like Barcelona, and here in Europe that means that 
many times, you know, the city that had a waterfront had grown in the inner land, you know, because any problem? Uh -uh, hacerlo, hacerlo grande. People used to <coughs> run away from the from the waterfront because waterfront and ports mean wars, invasions, uh, you know, epidemics, and so on. So. You see there, you know, the the downtown Valencia is like five, seven kilometers from the from the old port, and uh, has been growing and expanding, you know, to, uh, uh, towards the sea. And in, and in that, uh, doing that, you know, what has happened is that uh, the urban fabric uh, from downtown has. Uh, uh, I say swallow up every every piece of uh, cultural heritage uh, uh, landscape or whatever was in the middle, no? Especially you know when 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 the city has uh, come to to an end to, with a neighbor uh, old neighborhood fisherman neighborhood uh, districts and uh, well we've had a big controversy because they felt that they, they didn't belong to the city they were like you know like a village uh, aside and well uh, with a different culture with with a different fabric uh, urban fabric and, and everything so it's a problem not solved it's a problem that has uh, have, has gone with uh, to a lot of controversy and still hasn't been hasn't been solved nowadays so uh, with all these factors we we gather uh, you know to make some reflections and taking advantage I tell you of, uh, of that spot of that opportunity to uh, of being you know on the on the on the spot uh, well with a, with a, a sport venue like uh, America's Cup okay uh, we gather with Jan Nobel and Jose Miguel Iribas. Uh, Jose Miguel Iribas is, a, I think, a well-known person in, in, in the Institute. Yeah? No? <laughs> no? <laughs> well, it's, a, it's an urban sociologist. Uh, it's, a, it's a good friend. And so we started, you know, thinking of how uh, making some, some, or offering some solutions, you know, to all these conflicts. Landscape uh, problems, uh, social problems, you know, because the, those those neighborhoods uh, on the waterfront are, you know, low low class. They've been very bad treated, I'd say, you know, because <coughs> the the authorities have uh, haven't taken any 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 care of them, or uh, as a matter of fact, they they see them as a you know, as a, as a problem for their purposes and their goals and their aims. No? So uh, the port, it's a, well, in terms of a number of containers, uh, some years uh, is bigger even than Barcelona, some years Barcelona is bigger than Valencia in terms of numbers of uh, TEUs. No? Uh, but it's a it's a large one. Uh, Algeciras, Barcelona, Valencia are the, the three main uh, ports in Spain, and I'd say that many of the of the goods coming from China uh, end in Algeciras, uh, Barcelona, or Valencia. Some people say is the Madrid port because of the you know the the, the short distance is the shorter distance between the the center of the of the of the country and the and, the, and a port. No? The expansion of the port uh, has uh, has has been done without any sen sen uh, I'd say sens sensitivity or any care about the surrounding neighborhoods. And it uh, well, uh, it's a, a very industrial and heavy duty, you know, uh, activities uh, in, uh, port which. Uh, you know, it's not very comfortable to, to, to live with. So there is also a, a problem there to be solved. No? So as I say, the landscape, basically small orchards, you know, that has been the traditional, you know, landscaping around Valencia. Uh, the old neighborhoods, fisherman neighborhoods, the, the beaches, uh, Valencia has uh, northward and southward around 20 kilometers long. Uh, good sand beaches, uh, and it's a, a very attractive but 
but the, um, uh, you know it uh, hasn't been how would I say uh, exploded no? because why because I mean nobody thought in terms of a city you know looking towards the sea but the opposite no just <laughs> the, just the opposite well with all those um, Factors. What we thought. Well, we finally, there's a, another. I mean, or graphic accident, which is that there were um, a, a river crossing the the city, but every single year overflow. Well, uh, not every single year, but uh, every once in a while overflow. And and in the 50s and 57, there were a huge, massive overflow that killed many, many people and was a real disaster. So authorities decided, you know, to to bypass the the, the river uh, outside the, the the city, which is was a huge infrastructure. You can see, you know, down there is the new uh, riverbed, and the one with the with the red line uh, shows, you know, the ancient riverbed riverbed with all the, you know, uh, medieval bridges and, and Gothic and, and it's beautiful and it's been transformed into a green uh, highway uh, crossing uh, non-stop, you know, the, during five miles, eight kilometers, nine kilometers, the city, which is a phenomenal uh, attraction for everybody and uh, very celebrated and it's been a very transforming project in the city. Uh, now you can feel, you know, the green uh, in the city and you can uh, walk for maybe an hour and a half without stopping or, or watching or uh, I'd say even listening to the cars, you know, which is it's something uh, really special and, and it's an attraction for every people that comes uh, to the city for tourism purposes or whatever. No? So uh, this project, the, the, the riverbed, the old riverbed garden, uh, stops uh, like uh, it ends uh, I'd say in the last kilometers before it connects uh, with the sea uh, with the port because they they, they, they stop they, they put like a wall or whatever you want you, you want to say so there's a piece the last part which is not you know concluded and it has to be done okay so that was another another issue that has to, that had to be solved you know with the project. And as if you see, you know, what we did is to think the whole project around and starting from the port, which was, you know, the, the uh, you know, is the crossroad, is the is the is the place where everything or the whole energy of the project uh, has to be spread, you know, around and, and you know, and the problem for the city is starting in the port because is where everything came in from, you know. So. Uh, here you see an image. Uh, you, you see the Malvarosa Beach, uh, where we thought that there has to be done, you know, some uh, intensive uh, retail and somehow and with interruptions, you know, in in, uh, in order not to make a barrier, a barrier, no, for the for the back neighborhoods, you know. Uh, so keeping the same, you know, fabric and the views and not high rise, but, you know, uh, with some uh, harmony and with some, you know, rhythm to have uh, enough uh, retail and residential, you know, offer uh, to, well, to make a, a, a living place, a, a, a vibrant place, you know, to walk, to live, to use, you know, to, to shop or whatever, no? And uh, well, it's a uh, what we are going to see are images, you know, uh, on a large scale. We 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 haven't gone through to uh, to uh, you know through a small detail because uh, this is a public-private project. You know, there are many places to be well mm, re re rethought or redone or refurbished or whatever, which are public, uh, like the port. Like the beaches, so uh, you have to you have to have you know the the the, the agreement with the authorities. Otherwise, it's impossible. 
and so we've we've gone through that process and we almost had you know like a like a framework to start with but then the, the crisis came <laughs> so now there's no private money either public money so we are in a standby moment no? Uh, well, this is another perspective of what could be, you know, the the all the this uh, two kilometers uh, walk, uh, you know, uh, in the Malvarosa Beach, and you know, the, with uh, the intention of having a lot of amenities and to connect, you know, the neighborhoods uh, with the port and so on. This could be, you know. Uh, an image of uh, of this part of the of the project, and this is the old port. Is uh, we could call like the Port Bay here in Barcelona, uh, where we intend to to place a lot of uh, amenities and public uh, uh, public amenities uh, and, and and private ones, and also some uh, residential for in terms of. Uh, how do I say, UBPO, uh, affordable housing you know, for, re for renting, especially thinking on the uh, university population, which is uh, two miles away from here. And uh, Valencia has 120,000 students uh, per year uh, resident. So there's a large community that would be, I mean, that needs places, you know, to be together and share, you know, spaces and uh, in a way of uh, crossing ideas and, and, and interact between them, you know. It's also a, a project thought for the creati creative uh, people, class, or whatever you want to call them, and, well, it tends to attract talent from, uh, from people of the universities, and, uh, well, uh, Developers, apps developers, and people uh, related with uh, new technologies and so on and so on. If you see in the in the left, uh, on, on your left, there's the an image of what could be the end of the of the riverbed garden. You know, uh, and the idea is to to mix uh, green and and building. Uh, well, it's an image, it's an idea, and it, uh, there are channels, water channels, you know, that connect w with the, would connect with the, with the port, and uh, this is a, the cruise terminal for the cruising boats. Uh, in, that could be the place for the, for the residential units, and, well, uh, on the other side, there are more. It's more oriented to, uh, let's say, offices, hotels, and all kind of commercial type of uh, buildings. So, well, this could be. There's also fisherman uh, market, you know, fresh fresh fish markets, and restaurants, and, and so on, so on. And so many. Uh, the idea is having a place with 24 hours a day seven days a week activity and mixed uses you know and, and trying to mix the, the uses in terms of of uh, being efficient uh, socially efficient the place no? not, not not making you know those uh, uh, malls or whatever that you know, are open for you know Saturday afternoon and evening and then you don't see anybody around the rest of the week Okay, so there are more views and images. Those are the channels uh, coming into the in the port. Uh, well, those are designs, uh, an auditorium and a museum of the America's Cup. And well, there are hundreds of uh, ideas to to fill you know the project with activity, with people and density, and and trying to connect. Timetables and, and and keeping the place uh, alive and and and, and vibrant. Mm? This could be the end of the of the of the riverbed, as you see. Uh, well, the Calatrava uh, museum and all that you don't see here, but is uh, in, the, in the last bridge. 
from the last bridge to the, to the left, you saw the Calatrava uh, show, and then this would be the rest, which is uh, undone already, you know? And this would be another uh, residential area where we uh, expected to do, you know, like uh, Vicente Guayar did in, in Valencia, you know, those urban orchards where there are, there's a lot of tradition in Valencia you know, to, of, of uh, agricultural purposes and all that, you know, and people feel it like something uh, of them. So the, the, the intention, the idea was to have, you know, big spaces uh, in the inner, uh, let's say, neighborhood where people could, you know, grow their own, their own vegetables or whatever. No? So this is a perspective and uh, Valencia is, uh, I, I think, like Newark, very flat. So one of the, of the, uh, of the aims of uh, rising uh, some, some of the buildings, of some of the units, uh, uh, is uh, to have like a, a reference, a visual reference, because in Valencia you don't know where the sea is. Uh, you get to the city, you, get, you, you are in, the, in downtown, and you, you, you have no idea where the sea is. <laughs> Barcelona has it easier because, I mean, you, you, you go downhill and you always more or less have a view of the sea and the waterfront. But in Valencia, you don't see at all. You don't know. If you, if you are not from Valencia, you don't know where you have to go northward, southward, whatever, to, to find the sea. So having those high-rise buildings there is a matter, it's a, it's a way of, uh, of having references, visual references, and you know, to show you know, a city that wants to you know, grow and, and be active and all that. Well, I don't want to be very... <laughs> that was another project which was uh, what consisted in uh, illuminating all the, all the, how do you call it, the, the las gruas, uh, the crans. Crans. The crans. Uh, which, uh, in France, I think there's a, it's not Le Havre, but the, another port where they, they have done it. And it's been a real success, and it's an attraction. And it's funny because the people that, that work on those grounds, they, they, they feel proud now because they, all the tourists come, you know, on, on buses and things like that to see how they work and how they, they, they act and all that. It's like a scenography, an urban scenography, and it's a, it's a way of a, a approaching the, the industrial port to the, to the urban fabric and the, and the urban scene because otherwise it's, it's a, there's like a barrier there. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice project, I think. Well, this is uh, an overall image, and well, that's, uh, that's uh, almost all about. <laughs> Thank you very much, and that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Ignacio. Okay, so I think it's fair now to open the floor for, for Mario and Russell. Uh, I, was, I was just reflecting when listening to, to you that, um, for instance, if you think about, about Valencia's example, Valencia's example is, is, is a, a model of urban development taken to its limits. And, and it's a sort of capture of the state, in a sense. So all the corruption problems around uh, land development had to do with, with that sort of capture of the state in, in, in Valencia. If you think about Barcelona, for instance, I think that uh, I had this idea, especially when listening to Ron, and I, open, I want to open the floor around this, this idea, that uh, most of the time, when you're developing a project, you have a contingency plan just in case you fail. Yeah? So you want to know what to do just in case your amazing idea doesn't work. But I was thinking when, when listening to Newark's example and Valencia's example and thinking about Barcelona, for instance, or other European towns, that uh, most of the time the final city that you have is the result of the opposite scenario. What happens if you succeed? For instance, in Barcelona, it was a huge success in the early 90s, yeah? But that poses a huge challenge, yeah? As long as you succeed, then you end up repeating yourself and, and through gaining identity, you lose identity at the same time. 
And that may happen in other places. If you think about Berlin, for instance, Berlin is the result of a success, but an unexpected success. So the wall tumbled down in, 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 18, sorry, in 1989, and you end up with a polycentric city that was never expected. And now it's a model of a polycentric city, but it was never expected. If you, if you think about uh, Valencia, the, the problem is not what happens if we fail. No, the problem is if what happens if we succeed in those uh, strange developing ideas, taking the urban development model to its limits. So my question would be, uh, in terms of how you envisage these uh, 21st century cities, uh, what happens if we succeed? What happens if you, if you succeed? Um, <coughs> I, I, think, I think what happens is, um, is that you set the bar for a city. When you're sort of first moving a city, you, you set the bar for a city, and um, and what I hope happens, and what what I have, and, and is that these um, projects um, and the developers think beyond just the bricks that they're building. And if the if that becomes the mindset, that if every project you approach. If you're thinking about how is my building going to contribute to this community, you hope the ideas just get better and better. Um, and, um, and that's really sort of the hope. Uh, you know, um, um, it's, um, and, 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 and it should be true. Um, when it truly is sort of open source, when it truly is, when you really are engaging the community and finding out what they want, when you really are uh, um, involved, uh, the, 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 the politicians are involved, the community is involved, the state's involved, uh, the ultimate end user, the stakeholders are involved in planning and designing this stuff. Uh, there, it becomes a pride of ownership and, um, and, and that's really sort of what we're trying to do and we're seeing it. Um, so projects that have come after us in the planning and process have really stepped up the quality of the architecture, have really thought about sort of um, um, what they're going to contribute to the community, whether it be, you know, fresh foods or whatever it is. And so what you hope succeeds is, um, is that you create this ecosystem of good ideas. Um, I can tell you... Um, I can tell you from a planning point of view why these cities failed in the first place. Um, in America, we have a blessing and a curse of having way too much land. And early on, before the turn of the century, most urban planners would design a city where you work in one place and you live in another. Okay. I can tell you, as a kid growing up in North Jersey, living 15 minutes away from Manhattan, when we were 16, 17 years old and we got our license, we would tell our parents, we would drive around the block, but we couldn't wait to go to New York City. And we would go to Lower Manhattan, the center of the financial universe, and it was a ghost town. People went there to work, and they go to the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, Westchester, Bergen County, and that's where they slept, and that's where they, they lived. Over time, we realized this was a mistake. And this was also the same issue at Newark. Downtown Newark was strictly a working environment. At night, at 5 o'clock, there was no one there. This left the city dark, and it also left it unsafe. So that's the beauty of the planning and what we're doing now in Newark in Teachers Village. We are trying to create a 24-7 community, bringing jobs, commercial, and also residential into one place. That's what makes the European city so special. That's what makes Barcelona so special. America never had this. And as some of our cities begin to renovate themselves, Baltimore, Philadelphia, uh, even Chicago, you're, you're beginning to see more, more of a push, more of a planning for that 24-7 downtown living, work, play, live, all in one space. Okay. 
from my viewpoint, I coined the phrase of connecting Soma Village to the global village. Because ultimately, every city, every world-class city today, London, New York, is cosmopolitan. There are people from all over the world that want to go there. And therefore, Newark has the potential to attract people from all over. Just like, look at yourself, I understand there are 100 students from 33 countries. Just you being in the same room together brings ideas from your culture, your heritage, into one place. And that creates ideas that allows every one of you to enrich yourself. And as we say, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts because you multiply each other. So Newark, by bringing the global village to Newark, it will allow Newark itself to bring the people who left the central downtown area to come back. But it comes back because it's vibrant, because of its youth, because of the new ideas that new people bring in. Uh, and the new people are from all over the world because after all, just like in this room, we're all global citizens. And that is part of the multiplication effect that a global village at the local level, each one of us can provide. So that is part of the fascinating story and the fascinating aspect of what this social transformation can lead to. And it's sustainable because new people will generate new ideas and become organic growth. And that the same happens in every city in the world. Organic growth from global connectivity, which now is at the speed of light, just the internet. But then just bring the people in to collaborate with each other, it ultimately enriches each one of our lives. I, Gonzalo, uh, just, well, just to mention a few, uh, two ideas. No? Uh, <clears throat> you, you were asking, how would it happen if, if, if you were successful in Valencia? No? I don't know because I, we haven't been really. So, the, so I don't know whether this is good or, or, or is bad. No? Uh, what can I tell you is uh, there's a lot of reflection of and, and, and a lot of uh, uh, sensitivity. No? And we've been working with all the um, how to say all the parties you know involved in those controversies to, to know what's going on and why you know and and we've done a lot of research and we've talked to them and we've exposed our ideas in in, in every in, in every single you know uh, piece of the of the of the whole puzzle you know? and what we're trying to do is to show that there's a city there a million city a million, a million there's a million and a half inhabitants in Valencia, uh, but that is one, for example, of the first uh, is the first city in Spain that attracts Erasmus uh, students. I don't know, there is five thousand students every year coming from all over Europe, which is uh, an interchange program uh, uh, funded by the by the European Community, which is very interesting. It's a very tolerant uh, city, and it's a city with a, a, a incredible uh, climate. You know? So, we, what we're finding is that there's an attraction uh, from people all over Europe, especially people from the creative class, trying to go to warm places or and tolerant places, and places where they can express themselves, you know, and interact. And we wanted to make a project, you know, for to attract that that people. We we think that's the the, the transforming part of the society, and we wanted to offer, you know, some some project. We haven't been up to now successful, so <laughs> we cannot say well, how it happened in case of. No. But that was the idea. That was the idea. You're on I was thinking about um, something that happened here in, in Barcelona, in, in the old town of Barcelona, is that you could see it was, it was, it was a bit uh, dodgy place to go a few decades ago. But then it started to be very chic and very fashionable. But the whole composition in terms of social tissue of the, of the town changed. And you could see young professionals, uh, 
with higher income, going and buying places to live in, in, in that. that. That posed some problems. And so I was thinking about, if you think about the first generation of teachers buying your houses and living there, there's no problem. It sounds excellent. What about those who want to buy those houses in maybe 20 years? Because if you become very attractive, then you won't be able to keep prices as low as you say. And my second question, going back to some of our mental sustainability issues, is that what we have observed in many places in the world, and, and, and obviously also in, in Europe, is that, again, uh, su success may bring some negative outcomes in the sense that, for instance, if you think about energy efficiency in your buildings, and that's definitely something that it's entailed in the sustainability discourse. But what happens is that all the energy efficiency gains that you get at an individual building uh, may be outweighed because of scale issues or because of energy prices issues. So as long as you don't consume so much energy, prices go down, energy becomes more attractive, and then you have a rebound effect, yeah, which is described like that in the literature. And, and that, that happens as well in terms of mass transit, that happens again in terms of water efficiency, that you become efficient, that's good in the short term, but as long as you have any accompanying measure, in the medium and long term, you end up using more energy, more water, and just because you didn't take into account those rebound effects through uh, energy or water markets. Well, well obviously, f from an architectural point of view, um, one of the things that we always try to stress for, for our clients, that an energy efficient building, by implementing some of the technologies, you, you may uh, incur a slight cost. However, you get it back tenfold, not only in the life cycle of the building, but also in the efficiency of the people living and working, specifically working in those buildings. We do a lot of work for, for several corporations throughout the Northeast. And by just creating a more environmentally friendly workplace for, let's say, a, a, a staff of 500 people or so, could you imagine if you make those people 5 to 10 percent more efficient at work? Okay, produce more work during the day, less absenteeism, 5% times that payroll of 500 people. That is a real payback number, okay? So that is something we, we stress to all our clients when we're renovating a building, renovating a space, designing a new building. And even in the residential end, especially, you know, I'm walking through this, 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 this wonderful facility here and everyone's thinking an idea to make the world a better place through architecture and, and how to how build a better building. It, it's universal through all people, all young people. Today in America, for the first time, young people want to live in urban centers. They want to live in a green building. They want to live in a building that has a lot of natural light. They care, they care about the environment more than, unfortunately, our generation. That's just, just the way it is. They don't really mind having a car anymore. They want to take mass transit. This is a first in America. So as we are working, and we're currently working on other residential projects in Newark, America is obviously very diverse. We are getting people living in our residential buildings from all walks of life. From middle income, rich income, they're coming to Newark, they want to be close to the city, and they simply want to live a more greener life. Yeah, I'll say something too. And so I, I think I first I want to say I swear I'm, I'm a capitalist, but <laughs> when it comes to I think there's two different answers there. When it comes to environmental policy, I strongly believe it, it has to be good policy. Um, that it has to be uh, community-oriented policy, it has to be larger than that, it has to be regional, um, and it has to be national. Um, 
And um, and so you know what those policies are. We're all tinkering. We play and uh, we play with it. But uh, from that standpoint, um, it, it's got to be. It, it can't be done. On, I, I don't think it can be. It can be done on the individual level. Everyone should be cutting down and be as much as efficient as possible. And we should be implementing as much green policy as we can in all of our buildings. But ultimately, you can. You know, when it comes to the environment, it's you know. You, you, you have one bad actor and it ruins all of the net efficiencies and gains you have. So from that standpoint, I think you need policy. On the other, on the other hand, I do think that once people start to, under, when developers start to understand that their communities go sterile, that they go through this evolution that what made them cool, what made them succeed, all of a sudden they start to, you know, uh, and I hate to use Starbucks, but they trade up the local coffee shop for a Starbucks and they start to see that that goes sterile. If developers start to really understand that they're actually in the long term devaluing their property, actions will start to change. And I think you're starting to see that. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, a, a, a beneficiary of that thought. I, 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 I lived in Manhattan. I lived in Manhattan in Greenwich Village when it was it had its cool and I saw it lost its cool and and it's why we are very focused on um, you know middle income housing why we're very focused on our retail um, is to mom and pop operators cool operators individuals that we like um, that can provide the same product but better and cooler than the Starbucks and 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 quite frankly it's for my long-term sustainability sustainability because I don't want to be competing. I don't want the customer to be able to go one mile away to a shopping center and get the same thing that they can get in my retail. I want to have unique destination oriented retail and that's for self-preservation and capitalism. So I think that, um, I, I think from that standpoint, um, you got to understand why you succeeded um, and you have to be true to why you succeeded. And so, um, uh, I, you know, and, and then I think um, also, I think, I think it's a policy tip. You mentioned that I think something that was very appealing for me, which is the essence of good cities, uh, has to do with middle income dwellings. Uh, and, and, and you can see that in the best cities in Europe, for instance. Uh, are you facing some sort of barrier? Uh, in terms of the North American view of, of life and or it's happening what Russell was just mentioning that people just realize that they want to live in, in downtown and are, are, you, are you trying, I mean if you want to transfer some of the best practices in Europe to Newark what are the drawbacks that you would have to overcome? Transfer what it's in Europe into Newark. What are the drawbacks? Um, I think that um, I think Europe can get over regulatory. So I like pop, I like policy, and I like good policy. But it's got to be good policy. Over regulation can kill urbanism. Also, um, I think that. Um, I think Europe and the, the best cities in Europe have to worry about the same thing Manhattan's suffering, worrying about its sterility, losing it because only the affluent can live there. So there's cities in Europe that in the city center you have only affluent people there, which quite frankly is boring. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those are, and those are the elements that we sort of focused on. Uh, um, and. Um, um, and and so striking that balance, um, you know, again, why Newark has a benefit? We get to sit back, look at all the mistakes everyone else made, and say, let's try to fix it. But we, you know, you're only one person, so how? Uh, but we did con we did buy a lot of land so that we can control the trajectory and the destiny of the neighborhood. But um, it's always a very careful balance, and and it and then it comes down to the ethereal stuff. Good leaders in city and development community how do you how do you perpetuate um, that culture in a city and uh, and and in a company um, and in a community um, and it, it, it's a trick that um, eludes many but there are many that get it right and so the the, the, the and so um, 
it's tricky, but you know, it's uh, it's it's establishing a culture. I, I think that you, you have, as a real estate developer in in, in the U.S., uh, you have an advantage that that is that you're focused on on renting. And here, all the real estate model, business model, is based on on, on sales and pre-sales. I'd say in pre-sales. So, in terms of uh, having the control of, of the overall of the uh, on the long run, uh, if you if you are focused on a on a on a certain type of uh, income or or rent or whatever, and you have the control of putting that rent, you control better the, the 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 outcome of the project in in Europe and I'd say especially in Spain uh, real estate developers are thinking on on selling before the architect is designing you know so you lose the control before you end the the, the before you end the uh, the building no? so that's an advantage and what you were saying about the over regulation it's really a real problem in Europe. Uh, it's true that we have a, 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 a very large uh, heritage in terms of uh, uh, architecture and cities come from 2000 years uh, along. So we need to have uh, very conscious about that and, and very careful about those, those aspects. But it's true that the new developments are uh, are based on lower densities that used to be. I mean, it amazes me that the Eixample in Barcelona, which is uh, world-renowned and famous and, and beloved and everything, was four square meters over of, a, of a construction over a square meter of uh, soil. And now all new developments, not only in Barcelona, but in, in, in almost all over you know, all, 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 all the cities around Spain, uh, density uh, in terms of uh, uh, rising rights are one meter for one meter, which makes you a lot of uh, roads, a lot of green, a lot of whatever you want, but you don't see people around. And, and I think that's a, a real problem, and we, are, we should I mean, you should come here and say to the European, you know, uh, city officials, uh, "Hey, look what happened to us! Don't do it, because they're doing it." And we have traffic jams, and we have empty downtowns, and we have, you know, those uh, garden uh, city type of uh, uh, development, which are awful, and it's coming as a fashion or because people think that is the, the right way or and and they don't and they, they don't face they don't see what's going after that you know? so the same way we may have something to say in, in the US I think the US should come and be very active in Europe saying you're going on the wrong way <laughs> okay so that, I wanted to say that because I think it's, it goes this way and it's, I, I, it's sad and it's yeah. sad yeah. I'll say one thing. The, one of the important things is, though, is uh, not only diversity in the socioeconomic that you, the population that you're targeting your residential, but it's also um, in the offerings mm -hmm. also. So diversity in the offerings, because it is important mm -hmm. that people have ownership in the community, literally own their homes and own their apartments in the community. You can't just have renter communities. Mm -hmm. And so we, we went rental on the first phase because that was what was feasible. Mm -hmm. the, 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 because, because I could keep the long-term upside. Mm -hmm. um, it was okay to build the buildings at what probably was a below market return because I knew that I had 100% of the upside going forward. And so if I sold it, You'd sell at a loss, and you just couldn't make the project happen. But in the future, we will have housing um, for sale. Mm -hmm. um, we will have luxury housing, and we will have affordable housing. Yeah, and my point is, is you, yeah, you have to have a sort of the whole mix. But yeah. um, you're right. I mean, and, and, and policy is uh, is key. Okay. So as long as there are, <laughs> I think we have we have a any questions? And if not, thanks. Oh, there's a question there. Just a sh short one, yeah? Uh, yeah, for a moment. Um, just on that uh, rental versus uh, sale, was, uh, was it a factor to consider that based on the, um, because of the 
massive group of students structure and they chucked them into the land to affect it to rent. Uh, also about the you know, economics holding onto the land and therefore uh, hoping for a, a rise in the value of the real estate. Okay. I'm sorry, so we bought the land. Yeah. We bought the land. The product we were building was rental housing. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and the thought there was that um, that if we're going to, if it's difficult to build today because it's a new market, it's an emerging market, um, that if I keep 100% of the upside, at least I can benefit later from the return. So when you look at, you know, to get into the nitty gritty, when you look at a pro forma, your early years are going to be terrible, but if you can see some growth in the marketplace, you're going to have returns and so on. And that's why we rent. The other thing with the rental product is it played right into the middle income housing. By having rental product, I can really appeal to um, middle income um, um, renters um, and create that diversity. The third thing from a plant perspective is when you think about it, and what we were sort of thinking about is, is that with the rental product, we get turnover. So the hope is you get, and you know, we were very focused on teachers that are young teachers. The demographic is somewhere between 23 and 28. Most of the people uh, that are coming as new teachers into the marketplace. Um, and we were, our thought was we rent to them when they're 23, 24, 25. They get married or they stay, they get professional, they move up in their career, and then I could start building product in the community to capture them as they grow up. So, nicer and nicer housing product from the rental standpoint, of, uh, housing from uh, for sale, housing for sale for families, um, and then it's sort of, you start to create your own demand if you're building your community properly. Well, thanks for coming. Thank you very much to our MVTs and, and thank you, Iac, for creating conditions. Only, only for say thank you very much for coming, Ron, Ron and Russell coming from New York and, and Newark, Nacho from Valencia, uh, Mario from LA, and Gonzalo from Madrid. Yes, only I say. Gonzalo de la Cámara, Russell de la Rosa, Ignacio de la Iglesia. Probably is is time of the la bebida. Is drinking time. Thank you very much for coming.